I'll begin reading at uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3 at verse 8. And uh, I'll read verses 8 and 9, get into a bit of an introduction, and uh, then we'll get into our study. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Peter writes, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So what we've been looking at, and, and Peter at this point is about to close, is we've been looking at the duties of of the believer, the duties of the Christian. And uh, he's teaching us how we as Christians can make the best impression on those who don't know the Lord. We as believers, how can we make the best impression on unbelievers? And so, so in order to um, make the greatest impact, he has been writing concerning the responsibilities that we have as Christians. He spoke of our responsibility as citizens, uh, he spoke of our responsibilities in our work relationships, and, and we recently were looking at our responsibility in marriage. And so when Jesus is our center, all of the things that, uh, that we're involved in uh, based on our, our love for him and service to him by the power of the Spirit, well, all of those things are going to impact the society we live in, and uh, that's what is called being salt and light, and that's one of our, believer, our, our purposes as believers. In Matthew 5, 13 and 14, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You, he said, are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, when he said, you are the salt, when he said that you are the light, you might find this interesting when we've gone through the, the gospel of, of Matthew. Uh, I've pointed out to you that what he is literally saying is you are the only salt. He's saying you are the only light. And so Jesus intends the church to make an impact on a world that is decaying and is in darkness. And so we do that. We're supposed to do that. And if we're good citizens, if we're those who are working hard, if we have strong marriages, all of that is a testimony to a lost and a dying world. Because those things are the things that make us shine in any society. And so with that in mind, he's now writing concerning what we would call today community, community life in the body of Christ. Now, we use the word community. It speaks of having things in common, obviously. It, it speaks of, of a group having common interests and an identity. It speaks of sharing in fellowship. We are a community. When you walk in our main sanctuary and you look at, uh, at one of the walls, it, it speaks of a Jesus people community. There's a reason for that. We, we are a group of people with a, a shared identity. We are a group of people with common interests. We are a group of people who have things in common. We know that the church isn't a building. We know that the church is, is people, and, and, and the church gathers together to celebrate faith in Christ. We know that in order to be a member of a church, well, that occurs through faith in Christ, and that comes through believing the message of what is called the gospel. The Bible says that when we were saved, that God's Spirit immediately uh, brought us into the family of God. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, Paul said, we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given the one Spirit to drink. So when you got saved, like it or not, you were brought into our body, into our fellowship. You were brought into our family. And, and I don't know about you, but I, my parents uh, didn't give me permission to choose my brothers and sisters. They didn't. I don't know if your parents said that anything to you. Oh, by the way, we're considering having another child. Would you, would you have said, well, you know, that's cool. Of course, I'd love to. Most of us would have said, no, I don't want a brother named Frank. And I don't want Madeline and Becky. Because I enjoy being the center of attention. Why would you do something like that, right? And so they didn't approach me. Did your parents approach you and say, may I have permission to have another child? No. You did not choose your brothers and sisters. You probably wouldn't have. Most of the time, you'd say, ah, you know. 
No. Um, but we were stuck with them. And yet, at the same time, what would we do without them for those of us who have brothers or sisters? What would we do without them? And so the body of Christ, the Lord didn't say to me, he said, by the way, this person's going to get saved. Do you, are you okay with that? I'd prefer not. No, he, there are those in the past that I said, well, you know, probably not, but God is good. You know, so we're brought into the body of Christ and being brought in and baptized by the spirit into that one body, we realize that we're a family. And as a family in the things of God, we worship the Lord together. We're engaged in service together. Uh, according to Acts 2.42, speaking of, of the way the early church was, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So as a Christian community, working together, united in the things of the Spirit, we can make an impact on a world that watches. And the world can see how Christians are, and they can see the love of God that is worked out amongst us. So at this point, the Apostle Peter is, is developing some things related to community. And he's giving commands to the churches concerning the life of a church. He's going to be listing, and we'll look at this quickly, five virtues. Five virtues that believers possess that will give a character portrait of the church. And these are the things that safeguard what is called the unity of the believer. So he begins, first of all, verse 8, by saying, uh, all of you be of one mind. Now, he's not saying that we have to agree on everything. Of course not. We have people here who are, you know, we'll, we'll use athletics for a moment. You're, you're angel fans, right? <laughs> and I'm an L.A. fan. We don't have to agree we both know you're wrong. You see, so that's, that's, that's how unity is safeguarded, by you agreeing with me. No, he's not saying we have to agree on every single thing, right? He's saying our hearts are to be unified and united by faith in Christ. And that's the kind of unity that is a strong testimony to a society that is divided. And since it's so important, it's something that Paul was moved to emphasize when he was writing the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, this is what he wrote to them. He said, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. One of the devotional writers that I appreciate, it's a man named A.W. Tozer. Many of you know his name. And Tozer said this. He said, Peter was not asking all the brothers and sisters to settle for some kind of regulated uniformity. He was recommending a spiritual unanimity, which means that the Spirit of God making Christ real within our beings will also give us a unity in certain qualities and disposition. You see, Satan and our flesh conspire to create divisions. And when there's a division, especially in the body of Christ, it destroys the work that God is doing by his spirit. Jesus in Mark 3.25 said it like this. He said, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Unity is so important that Jesus actually prayed for it to exist within his followers. In John 17, 20 and 21, he said it like this. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Notice that the world may believe that you sent me, that they may have a united heart doing the right things together because that will be a testimony to a watching and unsaved world. Now, this isn't what you would call a fleshly unity-at-all-costs approach, watering down essentials of actual doctrine that matters. It's been said in the essentials, we maintain unity with the goal of preserving peace in the body. In the necessary things, unity. In doubtful things, liberty. But in all things, charity. 
So unity makes it possible to live out and communicate the gospel. We're working together, and therefore unity is closely guarded because when unity is absent, division is inevitable. That's why Ephesians 4.3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is such a propensity towards division and disagreement that the 21st century church can be referred to as the church on wheels. So you go to a fellowship, you get fed, you have relationships, friendships, and all things are going good. You serve in everything that pertains to a, a healthy walk with Christ, and then somebody hurts your feelings. And the first thing you do, instead of dealing with it, talking to them as adult Christians, you just leave. But you don't leave alone, because many times you'll bring people with you to the new place, the new haven, the new Eden, where you are now loved for everything that you know you are. And unfortunately, what has happened is division has occurred and a fragmentation of the body of Christ. And so we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We need to work things through so we can maintain that unity. So he speaks of unity. The second thing, verse 8, he speaks of compassion. Compassion is an interesting word. The word compassion literally is translated a fellow feeling. Fellow feeling for one another. Compassion is the sharing of sorrows of others. It's feeling what someone else feels. A sympathetic pity, a concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of somebody else. It is literally entering into the feelings of another with a desire, not just to feel their pain, but to alleviate it. So the expression of compassion is clear evidence that Jesus is in your life. Remember, we've referred to him many times, others have, that he has been called the wounded healer because he is the one who was not only wounded, but he also demonstrated compassion for those who, who were in pain. In Matthew 9, 36, speaking of Christ, it says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And so we have a unity of spirit, but it's not just a force you have to be together in unity. It's a compassionate unity. It's, it's a loving care for one another. And that's what it does. It, 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 this compassion uh, motivates us, moves us to, to relieve someone uh, of the pain that they're experiencing. Again, it's this compassion, this fellow feeling, this this sharing in the pain and wanting to alleviate it that made the church special in a very dark world. It it, is seeing the need of somebody and saying, I have the capacity to help you. I'm going to do that. In 1 John 3, 17 and 18, if anyone has material possessions, sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. And so it moves us, it drives us, this compassion and this unity, this fellowship that we have together to meet the needs of others. And then he says a third thing, love. Love as brothers. It it speaks of the love between friends. Uh, I, I have heard in the past sometimes people will tease about the apostles and all of that. And sometimes when you read the story of the, the men Christ uh chose for himself, you can see their humanity as it just, it just flashes off of the page of the Scripture. And, and sometimes you, you'll, you'll see the Apostle Peter say something that, that you, you scratch your head. You say, how in the world could he do that? How in the world could he? But he did. But he did. Why is that? Because he was a human being. Because he was not a perfect person. He was a human being. And yet these guys could, they would argue, uh, read your scriptures, read the gospels closely and watch how many times they actually were arguing amongst themselves with one central concern. Even when Jesus was about to go to the cross, they were arguing amongst themselves with one concern. Who is the greatest? Who's the greatest of us all? Jesus even asked them, What were you guys disputing along the way? What were you arguing about? They didn't want to answer him, we're told, because they were arguing about who's the greatest. And yet these are the knuckleheads that the Lord is going to use as a foundation for the church. 
So that gives me hope. <laughs> it, 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 really, it really does. They had a friendship. They had a friendship. When someone would say something, and yeah, that's the one thing about Scripture that I, if you don't see it, you don't add to it, but at the same time, you wonder. Sitting around campfires with Jesus, talking, asking questions and all, it must have been very personal, and it must have been very enjoyable. And I can assume, and I think it would be true to say this, assume that there were times that they asked stupid questions. And I wonder if the guys would kind of nudge the other guy and say, did you hear that? Now, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because we do that. We'll just give that little sidelong glance like, did he really just do that? That is the dumbest thing. So there's a friendship. There's an element of friendship that I think is very important in the body of Christ, that we can tease one another and enjoy one another and, and love one another like a brother. In Hebrews 13, verse 1, it simply says this, let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue continue. He goes on to say, be tenderhearted. Be tenderhearted. Tender heart speaks of a, a, a tender or a warm affection. Again, it, it speaks of a kind of sensitivity to somebody else's needs. This speaks not what, of what you're doing, though. This, this tenderheartedness speaks of what you really, really feel. And so you ask the Lord, you say to him things like, Father, help me Help me to have a tender heart. Uh, I'll be real with you, and I'll say it just briefly and keep going. That's one of the things I've asked the Lord to help me to have, to have a tender heart towards people. Because it's easy as a man to harden your heart. So I ask the Lord, help me to have a tender heart. May I, may I, may I have one and, and care about people? Uh, again, he goes on, a fifth thing, and you see I'm just running through these things. He says, believers are to be, notice verse 8, to be courteous. That's an interesting word. That's an interesting way of living. Uh, what is courteous? Well, <laughs> courteous, I'll say this briefly. I, I, this is one of the things I could talk about for a while. Believers are courteous. They have manners. It literally speaks of being aware of someone else. Being aware of somebody else. It speaks of being humbly friendly and caring. It speaks of taking your shopping carts back to where they're supposed to be <laughs> instead of leaving them in the parking space for people like me to have to do your work. <laughs> it speaks of not parking in the handicap where people have to find another place because some meathead is parking in the handicap space. That's, that's called courtesy. Uh, it, it, it speaks of not complaining to the waiter or waitress when she comes up to you and then tell them, I don't like the way this meat was cooked or I don't like the water you haven't. It, it, it speaks of courtesy. We don't have much courtesy. It speaks of shutting up in the movies. <laughs> You're not part of it, so shut up. It, it <laughs> anyway, I'll, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Be that with one another. Sometimes... Even in churches, people can not be courteous. They, they don't treat each other in the way that they ought to. Uh, Luke 6.31, do to others as you would have them do to you. That's still in the Bible. In verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. On the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So when God's spirit is moving, we can res resist responding in the flesh we can resist the impulse of reacting in response, in kind, if you will, speaking abusively to someone in return. You know, some people can't resist retaliating. Some people can't resist giving a piece of their mind. And sometimes they've given so much of their mind, it's, it's surprising they have any left because they're always giving someone a piece of it. They just can't resist re retaliation. Patience is called for... for um, to override the desire to get back. Again, some people don't resist retaliation. It, it, is, it can be very tiring. Some of you know exactly what I mean. In, in the past, before you came to faith in Christ, you might have been one of these who had to get even every time. But it can sure get tiring trying to get even or to defend your rights constantly. You're always finding something to fight about. But he says, no, this is not what we do. 
What we do, verse 9, is we, we resist the impulse to retaliate. We patiently endure the unfairness that sometimes we're faced with. Adopting the tactics of this world never secures anything of eternal value. So vengeance and retaliation will always backfire. In James 1, verse 20, it says, Man's wrath, the word wrath speaks of violent passion. Man's wrath does not produce the righteousness of God. Getting angry and telling people off isn't going to produce righteousness. That's why Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So rather than wanting to argue, make your point, win the argument, and defeat this person retaliating, he says, learn to turn the other cheek. Instead, he says, on the contrary, verse 9, blessing, that you may inherit a blessing. Instead of retaliating, what should we do? Here's something difficult. Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Well, let's get that out of the Bible. That's, that's tough. When I, when I consider that, that's, a, that's, that's really going against my flesh. The desire to get even, the desire to let my mind be known, my ways known. No, Jesus said, no, look it. You need to learn to bless those and pray for those. That's really what it means to die to yourself. On the contrary, he says, blessing. Blessing that you may inherit a blessing. The reward he's speaking about, this blessing, he says that you may inherit a blessing. It's the reward that we get by trusting and obeying him. He'd remind us that God has given us undeserved blessings. And we ought to do the same for others. Now, in order to develop this, verses 10 through 12, he quotes Psalm 34. He says, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him, do, uh, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Why? Well, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those, he says, who do evil. Who is the one who cares about having a life that is worth living? The question could be asked, and the answer would be the one who does these kinds of things. He's saying that when we resist the temptation to retaliate and to, to, to catalog sins, we actually can live in peace. Why is that? Well, because we are freed from the bitterness that destroys us, and bitterness will steal from you the joy of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that, the, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. It, instead, I hear, is that me? No. The rapture. <laughs> I thought, did I bring my phone in here? The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. You have been made righteous. Keep this in mind. This is so important. If you're a believer in Christ, you don't have your own fleshly righteousness because Isaiah tells us that righteousness is like filthy rags. It's leper's cloths during the time of the writing of the Scripture in the Old Testament as well as the New. If somebody had leprosy, leprosy was an oozing kind of disease. And so they would wrap it with cloth in order to, you know, be like a bandage. So when the scripture says your righteousness is like filthy rags, your righteousness is as filthy as the unclean oozing of a leper. So there's none righteous, no, not one. There's only one who could ever look at the eyes of somebody else and say, which of you can convict me of sin? and have nobody able to pick up a rock and convict him in any way, and that's Jesus. That's why we need him, right? That's why I need Jesus, because I don't have that. My own righteousness is filthy rags. So what the scripture says is I receive what is called imputed righteousness. We have been made the righteousness of God in him, Paul told the Corinthians. That means that God has given to me that which I did not have. He imputed, he gave to me something I didn't have. What I had was filthy. What he gave me 
was his own righteousness. And that righteousness is something that I live in now. And so the eyes of the Lord are upon those of us who have been made righteous through our confession of faith and following of Christ and receiving the power of the Spirit in our life and all of that. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. That means that he's aware of every action and every thought. Now, that should be sufficient to encourage a proper response to the things that are happening as well as the uh, feelings that I might have. Because if he's aware of everything which he is, we can trust him to do what is right. You see, a righteous man, verse 12, a righteous man is a man of prayer. A righteous person is a person of prayer. And whenever that righteous person prays, the eyes of the Lord are upon them and the ears of the Lord are open to what they're saying. So remember, these people that Peter is writing to are under persecution. They're under affliction. We'll be looking at that more closely as we go through this, this letter. So under affliction, under persecution, take your request to him. Proverbs fifteen twenty nine: the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And so we ask the question in verse 13, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? If you have a zeal for good, who can ultimately harm you? What is he doing here? This is very important to point out. He's directing their attention to eternity. Sometimes the trials you go through don't end quickly, right? Sometimes you wake up every day with the same sense of, man, when is this going to be over? That usually happens right after you got married. No. <laughs> when is this going to stop? I remember a young, a young lady who was talking to me one time, and she says, I am going through so much, I'm so much struggle. I'm going through such a trial when is it going to end? Pastor, when is it going to end? She was probably 19 or 20. When is it going to end? She said, it's been two weeks. I said, buckle up. Because life can be a continual wishing and hoping and questioning. So what do we do? When we follow the Lord, they're going through persecution they're having problems, and so he's beginning to speak concerning that. That's why he asks, who will harm you uh, if you have a zeal for good? So he points their eyes to eternity. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not going to endure suffering, but he's pointing to the reward that has passed the suffering. We need to remember that we're not in this alone. God is with us through everything that we endure. That is a very important thing for us to learn. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You can lose money, but you don't lose him. You can lose everything, but you don't lose him. I'm with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But he goes on in verse 14, and he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Now, who would ever think that they're going to suffer for doing something good? I was reading uh, recently of a, a man who actually, out of the goodness of his heart, he does it for free. He goes and mows lawns that are, are in need of being mowed. Some of you perhaps have seen. There are several people who do that. And uh, this guy does that. He'll go through neighborhoods. And he'll see the overgrown lawn and then go and knock on the door. He's been to my house several times. He's a great guy. No, no. And he'll, he'll walk up. Yeah, Marie doesn't always mow the lawn. I'm so upset with her. I'm, and I don't charge your rent. Come on. But anyway. But he'll do that. He'll knock on the door. And uh, is there anybody who lives there? No, it's been empty for a while. Then he, he'll do all of it. He edges and he mows and it's just a great guy. He's a great guy. But he's, I think he's getting sued by the city for doing good. Yeah, so 
So the question is asked, who's going to harm you for doing good? Well, sometimes people attempt to, even the city that you live in. Sometimes you can suffer unjustly. That's a fact. And sometimes you can suffer unjustly because you want to share with people about Jesus. You can, you can be maligned uh, on the job. You can have a difficult time in your own home. Sometimes the neighbors may, may think you're crazy or on the job and all of that, on the street rather. People may get upset at you. Now, most of us, if we do suffer persecution, can be verbally mocked. Sometimes we're rejected. Not everyone suffers the most violent kind of persecution. Hebrews 12, 4 says, you haven't resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Not everybody resists unto bloodshed. But what are we supposed to do when people are rejecting? Well, verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so what am I to do? What happens when I'm mocked? What happens when people are rejected? What happens? Well, he said, you need to have an answer. Verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready. Set your heart apart for God. Now, remember, in Scripture, the heart represents the center of all belief. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. The heart, Americans would say, I love you with all my heart. But in the, in the Scripture, you know that if, if I want to show an emotion, I'm going to, I love you with all my kidneys, you know, they, it's just, they just use different words and all of that. So the heart speaks of the center of us. It, it's where the issues of life actually originate. That's why Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, love uh, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So your center of belief, sanctify the Lord God in your heart, speaks about knowing him well. And that gives you strength to resist yielding under the pressure, under persecution, to deny the Lord. He says, be ready, verse 15, to give a defense. We are not only to know in whom we believe, and this is very important, we need to know what we believe. There are many who have a sincere, deep, passionate, I believe in God, that's almost like a romantic love that you might have for a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It's like you're dating Jesus. You have this emotional attachment, but you don't have mental understanding. As a man, I met a young woman named Marie. I liked her, and I had to get to know her. And it took time to get to know her. And the more I learned about her, the deeper I understood her, and the deeper our relationship became. Did I have a, a great affection for her early in the relationship? Yes. But did it grow over time? Yes. How? By getting to know her better. By getting to know the things she likes, the things she doesn't like. And then trying to cater to those things so I could manipulate her into doing things I want. No. <laughs> so... So we could have a real relationship, right? I mean, that's how it works, right? So you, you love the Lord with all that's within you, but you spend time discovering things of him. And the way you do that is, is through being in the word. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you are diligent to know him better. Now, as you get to know the Lord, you're going to be able to give notice for verse 15, a defense. The word defense speaks of a reason statement. It speaks of an argument. So you know what and who you believe, and you're prepared to share what you know. And when you do share it, you don't share it in an argumentative way. There are a lot of angry Christians who want to win arguments, you're not there to win an argument. You're there to win over someone to Christ. 
And so you have to be very careful how you do that. That's why Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. When it says seasoned with salt, salt being very precious during that day means that your, your speech should be attractive, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That takes a lot of time in the word. And so in verse 16, continuing, he says, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Now remember, they were calling believers evildoers. You see, a good conscience results from serving the Lord with a pure heart and a pure life. That integrity that you have as you follow him develops uh, an ability to speak to people because they know that you live what you're sharing. There's hardly anything that is less attractive than when someone tells you what to do when they themselves don't do it. There's that old phrase. First time I ever heard this phrase, I was in church. I was seven years old, and some kid was talking to me in church, and the kid in front of us turned around and said, you guys need to be quiet. And this kid sitting next to me said to him, practice what you preach. I thought, oh, that's deep. I'm going to put that right here. I'll keep that. <laughs> but, you know, it's true, right? Practice what you preach. Yeah, when I first got uh, saved, you know, I had people telling me, prior to getting saved, I had people telling me, uh, you really ought not to, because I like marijuana, you, you, you really ought not smoke pot. But I'd be looking at a guy with a mixed drink. And I said, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. Why are you telling me not to do this when you do that yourself? See, so anytime I share, I learned very early, practice what you preach. Don't, don't, you know, don't think you're perfect because you're not. But, but don't do things that you're telling others not to do and think it's okay because you're saved either, right? You have to be real. It has to be important to you to be real. And it gives you an integrity. And you can speak the truth without... Hypocrisy, he says, when they defame you as evildoers. The word defame means to cause humiliation by making false statements. Evildoers, we already looked at it. You find it in chapter 2 and chapter 4 also. It speaks of those who are rejecting what is legal. It's actually something we today would say are haters. It's better, he says in verse 17, if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Well, that's true, isn't it? It's better if it's the will of God for us to go through something for doing good than to receive just punishment for the things that I'm doing that's wrong. So he's saying, therefore, live in such a way that it brings honor to the Lord. Live in such a way that if you do go through something difficult, which all who, all who are followers of Christ will suffer persecution, not a single one of us, we've been looking at this on Sunday mornings, not a single one of us who are believers in Christ are going to get away with never having a persecution or a rejection. Uh, you have to get used to it. When I first got saved, I began being rejected and, and all of that. From the beginning, I've been rejected in that way as a Christian for, for 50 plus years, 53 years. You just get used to it. You know why? Because... It's inevitable that those who love Christ will go through difficulty. That's just the way it is. And I discovered, and I'll, I'll stop here, I, I discovered that the things that I have personally gone through have actually refined my faith, strengthened me, and taught me how to love those that, that haven't been kind. And there are quite a number of people that you encounter that are not the kindest and can sometimes be so mean and say such mean things even believers even believers you know i can handle it when the world says something to me because i expect rejection what i had to learn to do is handle it when the church did it when the church did it and some of the cutting things that believers can say it's very un very unfortunate we don't love one another the way we should but you know what if you're going to suffer for anything he said suffer for righteousness sake it's better if, you're, if you go through pain uh, unjustly than to receive a just punishment for doing evil. So make sure your life is straight. Make sure you do the right thing. 
So if somebody rejects or is angry or whatever, that's because they're rejecting Christ in me. James 1, and I'll close with this, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When you go through trials, as we all do, allow God to do his perfect work in you. Did you ask the Lord to make you more like him? How do you think he's going to do it? If he was a person who was rejected, why should I think I won't be? They murdered my master. Why do I think I'm going to be called person of the year? We're going to go through tough times. But guess what? Hold on because it's worth it.